Hi everyone, this is the Chat Chamber podcast by RDSL and we are welcoming this time Ivo Klotic, uh, who is a sworn advocate and he has his own law office. Hi. Hi Martha. Hi Christopher. So how, uh, how was your morning? Uh, how perhaps something uh, in your head regarding school or your workplace? Well, the morning, uh, Mondays, I think uh, some time ago, well, just maybe a few years ago, used to be like the days when I would say that, oh, it's Monday. Uh, and, and you feel kind of, um, you know, I think, sorry that the weekend has passed and that Monday is something that, you know, you have to get on, on track and start doing things. But um, I think for for past couple of years, it's been, um, have been looking at Mondays as exciting days. And uh, um, of course, the, the global changes that have happened, uh, I think, have also contributed to that. But uh, I feel very great about Mondays for, uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, for each, each of the days. So, and Monday mornings are actually great days than, as well as uh, Sunday. But I'm not uh, anymore looking at Mondays as a problematic day, if you will, uh, in a week. So it's actually, there are even Monday mornings that I'm, you know, looking very much forward to Monday morning. But like, like this one, for example, it's fun and interesting to come here. So um, uh, it depends how you organize your week, your life, your day. So um, then the Mondays become great days. So It all depends on what uh, what is to come on Mondays. Yeah, well, Monday. with mo- this Monday, a lot of new restrictions come again. Mm-hmm. So definitely an interesting morning, Monday morning to have. Um, how about this Monday morning, as it is the 11th of October, how it is going to have an impact on your law office? Again, switching mostly to remote working uh, or... Well, um, uh, it's it's great that um, I think what uh, I was thinking yesterday that we already did it on the 16th of March 2020 yeah, sure. when we when we uh, when we immediately implemented the procedures that we can now easily continue. So we've been actually working um, uh, adopting to the global lifestyle of remote working. So even without this these regulations that came effect uh, this morning. Uh, we have had um, uh, we have have given the, the our staff an option to come in for two days and spend three days uh, remote working. So it's been like we've been following the global trends that are uh, that I think are here to stay for the next three five years. Yeah, so this sure. is gonna this is gonna be, this is the new reality. So it's not a surprise. So our um, um, our team they we can work uh, remotely already. We have been working that and. Actually, uh, it's been very success- successful. So I have seen it as, as a great advantage also. And um, so we, we are, it's not a surprise. We're ready. And, and when, when things like that happened, I told there's going to be third, fourth, fifth. I don't know which wave is this one, but uh, you know, you have to be <laughs> yeah. ready for it. And, and we are ready. So it's great. And I don't feel any impact on that. And, and there are things that got on my mind um, in, in these three days when these new regulations came in and there is a certain task that um, let's say uh, I have still some things that I need to develop but it's good that each of these things these restrictions although globally it's not okay and, and locally it's not okay and and the way we have uh, evolved with, with all the things leading to this uh, pandemic but uh, I think that um, they, they give you the motivation to change stuff and, and to think. And it's, it's a great also push, if you will, in, in one or another way when you have these regulations. I'm, I'm not saying this is great that we have COVID, but you know, certain outer uh, circumstances in many cases give you the, the push. Uh, so, I mean, all in all, it's great. We're working, we have, uh, our team has, uh, uh, since the pandemic, we have Fridays. One Friday each month. Last Friday is a is a paid holiday, so everybody is remotely oh, off so off nice. everywhere. And as I said, we work remotely. We have um, I have adopted uh, certain techniques. When my my first career job was I was at working as the inspector at Interpol, so which was the international police office here in Riga. And in the police, you have a, they call it in, in Russian uh, well pet uh, minutka. It's a five-minute meetings, uh, and then in, during those meetings, they started, I think, at eight, 
So you, you tell what you're going to do today. Uh, we actually have at our office um, two of those, one in the morning, one in the evening. So we can, you know, people who are not at the office, we join in on online. So it's working very great. So. How about communication with the clients? You are the managing partner and right. you are one of the main persons the clients go to. Uh, how it has had an, the COVID has had an impact on your communication, how clients see this whole situation. Do they still prefer to have uh, video calls or they prefer to call on phone, emails? What kind of communication do they prefer now? I think when you just touch up on email, I think email is the fax now. Because yeah, uh, exactly. it, I, I remember the times of fax and uh, now I think email is a fax. So people call, of course, you spend a lot of time on the phone and you, you have video meetings. But, you know, I, we just had a mandate this, this year or it started uh, in the beginning of this year and we had a certain case that we needed to solve. And actually, uh, I was amazed that, that uh, going through that case, I only met clients in July. Well, we had been working with them before, but not directly, let's say, with the specific persons. And uh, they um, and, and we, we managed the case only by doing online video calls, phone calls, and I never physically met the clients. But, uh, you know, maybe it was because they, they knew us and we were working with them before, but we had a very, very com complex case that we needed to solve. And we sold it, so I think that proved for me that all these things can work. And then if you if you insist on your if you have your regulations, if you have your agenda, and, and this is how you want to work, then then I think if the client wants to work with you, then they have to adopt it. All. So um, the clients are understanding, and I don't practically I don't see a, a, a need for meetings. But of course, I mean, don't take me wrong. We are all human beings, the meetings are necessary, and, and you e even kindly invited me to come here, which we could do online because this is a podcast, so I would say why are we here, but uh, the, the physical contact is important, and, and, and this is what the nature, I mean, aside, it doesn't matter if you're a lawyer or somebody else, but we are created to have contact, and uh, maybe there were too much at one point, uh, all the unnecessary meetings, and maybe unnecessary gatherings and then uh, meetings without agenda and so but uh, I think you know it's it's a it's a balance balancing act your time at Interpol uh, I think that would be of great interest to our listeners uh, because of the fact that it's an international organization in in, in, in the end and uh, it has a lot of impact on on dealing with kind of these international investigations and 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 searching for perhaps criminals also and uh, but for okay so your experience there uh, what was uh, in your opinion the most uh, insightful kind of a insightful job or working task that you did and uh, perhaps how do these uh, skills that you developed there help you now Okay, well, first of all, I didn't work there for very long. It was just during my, my studying, mm -hmm. and that was in the third year, I think. But, uh, you know, it's just what I just mentioned, you know, five-minute meetings that I'm implementing in oh, 2021, yeah. <laughs> something that I have taken. As I see it, you know, from each job experience you have, you can take something, and, and uh, maybe you don't take anything, but, you yes. know, these five-minute meetings that I have been implemented, these came cl clearly from my experience in the first job. But at that time, I mean... I was just, uh, you know, now we, we have all these terrorist organizations and everything, and I was dealing with all the, I, I was in charge of the, the stolen cars and, and, and terrorists, so I didn't know who the terrorists are, the people, what do they do, and why are, why it's important, so I just, I needed to, you know, it was not electronic, so the people would send in papers, and you have to, have to type in an Excel sheet, so sort of create a database, so mm -hmm. in case somebody uh, would pop up, I don't know where my Excel sheets went, and if somebody really checked it on the borders, or I don't think anybody was from those persons that I was dealing with. Uh, there were very many strange people, photos that I was um, that I was dealing with, but I, I don't know where, where did this information go. From. I think that uh, you know, just it doesn't matter if it's Interpol or any other work experience you have, but um, that you you take these these bits and pieces like these as I said, five minute meetings. They come from there. If I would not be working there, probably I would not be implementing now in during COVID times the the. There's such a concept that was this uh, five-minute meeting. So, 
but uh, yes, Interpol was yes, as you say, in international organization, of course, and it's it was interesting. So I think the way why I started working there uh, is also because I like this international environment. So this is why I'm teaching at you know RGSL now. I, I'm by the way now the student at SSC Riga, so it's also no. an international environment. So I think the 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 thing is why it probably was my first job uh, was that there because I like the international environment so I have been so are your second masters or I'm doing like MBA like some there's advanced programs as SSC? well yeah yeah it's EMBA executive MBA mm -hmm. so that's what I started doing and uh, we just started it in September so yes it's a lot of fun also international environments so. yeah for sure. and you never know what you know you will take of course uh, I'm sure I'll take many things out of these studies but uh, then again, after years, you can say, well, what did you gain from that, like from your first working experience as well? Mm -hmm. uh, Klotinch Sergis Law Firm has been established uh, around 30 years ago. Um, so it under the law firm market before, like a long time before, mm -hmm. like the new technologies and stuff. But my question is, uh, how... How, how it is for uh how is it for a law firm to be in a market where there are different other law firms how do you manage to stand out and recruit clients mm -hmm. to yourself is it like speci being specialists in specific field but then there are again bigger law firms who specialize in many fields mm -hmm. how do you manage to be in the market then mm -hmm. So I mean, right, rightly you said. So the origins are in '92, so it will be 30 years next next year, and it was established as a family law firm. So my my mom and dad, they together with the two other partners, they established also family members. They established this law firm, so it became a family law firm. So now, uh, of course, if you are 30 years in the market, arguably, you know, people can say you can you have the clients, and you should have clients if you're for so long. So like people drinking Coca Cola still because was established a long time ago so people know they drink coca-cola but i think the the one of the why how how can we keep the clients and why we have the job and how do we survive in the legal market is uh, there are core principles that you invest uh, in 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 the law firm and i think the the, the approaches that are there the, the 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 attitudes you have and the way you, you work with the cases so Think that um, my my dad, who is um, who is a founding partner uh, at the firm, uh, he has set um, uh, the benchmark, if you will, or, or different uh, milestones that we need to fulfill in order for us to be a successful law firm. And uh, when once you have the, the the trust from the clients, that you build the trust from the clients, and they they know uh, this is uh, one of the the angles. But I think the the most important aspect is reputation. So you have to have a reputation and, and you don't get reputation overnight. So, uh, and, and uh, you know, who is going to praise you if you don't praise yourself? So I'm, uh, I'm very pleased that, um, that uh, very often we hear that uh, people are turning to us as new clients or existing ones are, are making remarks that because of our reputation, uh, we, they want to use our services or to, or be with us uh, so but you know reputation so it's uh, you can have a bad reputation also so uh, and, and then people like a bad reputation as well I think <laughs> but uh, we, we have a good reputation what builds a good reputation I think um, and then uh, it is about what are your uh, core values so that of course it's very important for clients that you have the professionality but then arguably you can say oh, other firms have profession professionality as well but of course, you you need to have an understanding and experts in a certain field so that people know that they can turn for help in certain areas. So, and then uh, clients very much value confidentiality, which is an attorney-client privilege, of course, as it is in the law. But uh, not always, let's say we are uh, or we as a general as a law community are um, following these standards. So the clients respect that uh, they can uh, they can have confidentiality and that their matters are treated with confidentiality. Um, then I think, al although it might be uh, sort of um, very simple, but it's honesty. And yes, so all these these factors you combine together, then I think there there you have it. So uh, I mean, if we have if we have to say it in 
two minutes. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> so, uh, you are known that you are uh, an arbitrator, a mediator. So it is a bit different, of course, as just being an attorney. And uh, so how would you say this kind of a task differs from just per perhaps representing your client mm -hmm. at the court and uh, what are the skills or the knowledge necessary to be one? Well, I think the, I have to be thankful to RGSL. It's, it's not a commercial note for RGSL, <laughs> but I have to be thankful for them because this is wh how I got into arbitration. So when I was doing my master's here, uh, late Professor Rumberg uh, was, was also my mentor for the master's thesis. And this is when I fell in love with, with the arbitration. So arbitration is also my passion. I liked it. I did my master's thesis. I went to uh, to Stockholm to university to to with the kind permission of uh, the late Mr. Rumberg, professor that he was he gave me the, the opportunity to go there to gather the materials uh, that were necessary for my master's thesis and I think uh, uh, you know it kind of, I think it uh, attracted me in in a way because it's um, it's not court but it's uh, it's a forum where professional people gather to to solve the disputes. So it's a it's a business law eventually. So because you 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 deal with business disputes, so it's not you know arbitration, as a, you know, commercial arbitration is not about you know constitutional law or or labor law, but it's about the, the business disputes. So I think that that was an angle that attracted me, and and you can act as an arbitrator or mediator to solve the the, the, the dispute. As a mediator, do you help the parties to solve it, and as an arbitrator, you you are there to decide. Um, and I think it's it's a very much I what I like about it I think because I like let's say business meetings and, and doing business law and, and doing uh, deals and, and closing deals and, and, and you know carrying on with the mandate that client gives you for example to sell the business and, and to complete it so I think this is where also the, the business angle that is in arbitration is very much what I like and when you when you when you are an arbitrator what you ask is that once you are dealing with the dispute of course, in, in, in that respect, you're deciding about business law, so about business principles, and, and you incorporate law into that. So I think, yes, just, just you know, I fell in love here with arbitration, and this is how I, it was, you know, where I got with arbitration. And, and mediation, yes, it's, I have been, I think one of the greatest experiences I've had is that I was uh, participating, not as a mediator, but I was in a mediation process, which was, so far, the, the largest uh, we have had ever in the history of Latvia so it was about the train procurement. So we did like nine months mm. of mediation at the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce Mediation Institute, mediating about the, the trains that we still don't have in Latvia. Yes. But, um, <laughs> but uh, at that time, there we had a contract, and uh, it, was, it was a try to solve the, the, the issue with, with the trains. And it was a great experience with three very highly qualified uh, mediators in, in Stockholm and, 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 you know, parties also were respectful, uh, respectable, you know, from both, both sides and it was very interesting, yeah. Are you available to your clients 24-7 or how do you manage to put boundaries or mm -hmm. this is my private time, these are my hobbies and here I have also family not only working mm -hmm. and being for clients available always. I think my clients respect my time and mm -hmm. that's that's what is important and and then you know I respect their time eventually of course but they respect my time so I don't I don't believe in this 24 7 uh, I mean of course there are certain very few exceptions when you, when you can have a client say detained or, or uh, arrested and, and then you need to uh, act in certain cases when, when it is but then you know you know when these cases are but then they don't happen at night so it happens during the day <laughs> and then you cannot stay if you want to go and see client the, the, the prison closes they close the doors at five so you need to get out by five mm. so it's not like you'll be, be at night so I think uh, yes I have um, let's say the the timing that was necessary I have done in the past uh, that you know working as, as a as a cliche, you know, lawyers working all night and everything, but, you know, frankly, it's not productive because you don't have focus, you don't have attention, so uh, if it's about time management, so if you have to work at nights and if your clients call you at night, there's something wrong, I believe, in your time management schedule. So um, it is that, yes, the clients, they 
there are plenty of there is plenty of time during the day when we can yeah, communicate. For sure, for sure. So, and then uh, it is important that you have everything in balance, of course. But. I think what is interesting about your uh, experience, I think uh, you are the you are a member of the Fair Play and Ethics Committee. Uh, so, how does it how does it feel, and, and what does it take to be uh, in such a committee regarding mm -hmm. football and? Uh, what are the cases? What are the, the main concerns for, for the parties? What are the questions that you need to solve? Well, it's a, well first of all, it's a fairly new experience for me because I think it was, uh, was it I started last year, yes. So, um, I mean, the, the fair play and ethics, so fair play is about, you know, the, the fair play in football. So we have had a couple of situations already in Latvia where we had to review the cases. So. It is about, you know, and I think also in the context of pandemic, it's been that, you know, betting is very popular. So you can have these legal, illegal betting sites mm -hmm. and then uh, people bet on the games and then they agree with the football players how they're going to play. And uh, it's, of course, unprofessional. So all the international football organizations uh, and, and also here locally. So the task is to look after such such items. So. Uh, well, the interesting part is there, you get to watch the games, so you have to watch the game because you have to understand what, what has been the, the situation, but you have, of course, experts that are reviewing, you know, whether this, this or that moment by a player was professionals, you know, I'm not a professional football player, so I cannot say whether running out of the gate for 10 meters is, is sufficient or he should have not run out in that, uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a situation. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, then th this is about when we get to, as a committee, we get to ask the players to come to testify for the committee. Also, there are different violations and people don't know, um, let's say, how to communicate correctly and they have wrongful accusations. So it's about ethics, what, what can you and cannot say. Uh, so um, yes, it's, it's why, why there is a lawyer, because there are regulations and this is the way the Football Federation has constructed it. So each committee there has a lawyer as well. And uh, so the the way we review it is look after the football or is being played fairly. So it's interesting. Yes, I, I like I've been involved with football. I started actually for me was when when the former president Kaspar Gorch was uh, was elected. So he's our client, and then then we were assisting him with all the legal issues that have been there. So that's how I got involved in football. And yeah, it's interesting experience. Mm. Talking about fair play, but in a different sense, um, you touched upon bad reputation uh, concerning lawyers as well. How how they're approached uh, in within Latvian market, people know that oh on this other side there is gonna be that that guy who he's known for not playing fair or maybe having bad reputation of manipulating with the law so to say um, how many cases are there are in Latvia or how do you approach such situations when you know that this person is going to be on the other side for example well I mean uh, again if we are you have to be as a, as a, as a lawyer as attorneys members of the bar we have to stick to a certain case if you if you think somebody is you know uh, jeopardizing the law or, or stepping over the law or not obeying the law then of course you can go to the bar association, you counsel, and then you report such activities. And then in your case, what what I'm hearing you're saying is that if you have a person that has a you know different kind of reputation that you think is not a good reputation, how do you deal with it? I mean, it's just in as in any other meeting, you just factor in circumstances that are there and then it's good that if you know what the other party is capable of and then you always have medicine how to how to deal with, with the cases so I think that um, you have to you have to you know in any situation you have to evaluate the circumstances that are there and uh, you know you can choose also not to work in a specific case but if there is another party then you are just just uh, just in the situation you are but you know if you think you don't want for example work with some client you also can say you don't want to work uh, with a client because 
you know, he or she has a, or a company has a bad reputation. Yeah, for sure. I just, uh, it is always so interesting, uh, especially the, at the very beginnings of starting law studies. I remember during the first uh, first year, we all came in the auditorium expecting some kind of suits or how to get away with murder scenario that, you know, bailing out the bad guys and stuff, but then eventually you understand that it is just a TV series. Uh, part of it is not actually real life. And and also the law systems differ, common law and civil law systems mm -hmm. are totally different. I just wanted to ask you how it is, how, how actually these kind of situations are dealt with in the real life here in our country. Well, why do you think that uh, it's not like in suit? Or, or your experience with how to get away with murder is about lecturing, so that's another angle. <laughs> So, yeah. so it's not <laughs> happening sure. like in that, in that... Yeah, but being a de defend, defending lawyer of mm -hmm. criminals, that's mm -hmm. a very specific thing. Uh, bailing out the bad guys and trying to find the loopholes in the law, man man manipulating mm -hmm. um, the commission of people there, finding the right guys to vote in, uh, in favor of you, uh, for mm -hmm. judgment. Okay, well I think that these, these sitcoms that have this element, is uh, I think it's for theatrical also purposes. They, in many cases, they I'm not talking about being uh, with with the makeup at six in the morning and stuff. That, that's, <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's another thing. But is is uh, but we want to look at beautiful things and scenarios and people, and that's all understandable. It's not it doesn't have to be a legal sitcom to to have all this. Yeah. But the 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 thing that uh, they they are uh, sort of in in the suits and also how to get away with murder. You see all of like. These, these items that are different arrangements between made people and uh, between people to solve the situations. So go there and arrange with that and do me a favor this and that. I think it's uh, a lot of to do with theatrical also uh, approach because if you would try to do this in the United States, I think they have pretty pretty tough laws. They are they are they are let's say a very open democracy and you can do a lot of stuff in America and, and be very successful or not. But at the same time, you, you have these, these you know, if, if you do fraud, you go to jail for like 150 years or something. So what, what you see is in these sitcoms, I think they are exaggerating a bit because in practice, all the arrangements, you know, go there and talk to that and, and stuff like that, they are a little exaggerated. It is happening and this is the way probably um, a lot of things are happening, but it, it's, uh, I think, over-exaggerated. When you talk about the the bad guys and, and how to work with the bad guys, I mean, as as a lawyer, you know, you, you know that uh, nobody is guilty until proven innocent. Yeah. Uh, everybody is innocent until not proven guilty. Sorry. So, which means that um, uh, we we work with also white collar criminal cases, meaning that economic crimes, so bribery, fraud, all those you know that type of things. So uh, it is a long way before before a person gets con uh, convicted of um, of uh, criminal activity, and you have to uh, eventually prove many um, many episodes, if you will, or crimes he has done or she has done, and it's a it's a long way. And this is where the prosecutor uh, has the case. So um, he or she they come to the court and they defend their case, but we are there not just to look for the loopholes, but the, the level the investigation has been carried out and whether there is sufficient evidence that the person can be found guilty. So you can't just, you know, look at the news and say he's guilty. So uh, unless the person confesses, of course, then you can say, okay, he confessed. But then again, as a lawyer, you always need to, you know, double check whether that confession was really, the person was not covering up for somebody else. That's more on prosecutor's side. But for us, Working with, with economic crimes, I think it's a lot of also, like you, you were asking me about arbitration, there's a lot of business angle there. So you can't just come and say that not having, um, like we had in one case, not having a shareholders meeting at the legal seat of the company is the crime. And we have three prosecutors for 15 years coming into the court and saying this is a crime. So, uh, I mean, you can't have that. And, and apparently you need to have this business understanding. So, uh, and, and you, the person cannot be guilty of that specific crime because it's nonsense. So I think that, you know, once you are in a case, and of course from, from out, outside to the public, everybody seems guilty. You know, yes, of course they did something bad, and of course they, you know, but then this is why where we come in and, and we need to 
deconstruct, if you will, this this alleged crime and, and see whether there is a really a crime. So it's uh, it's the cases you choose to work with, but we work with white collar criminal cases when it comes to criminal cases, and then it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, when so I think because of your experience, you have very many kind of roles and many perspectives on this kind of a legal uh, situation solving uh, mechanism. So. Uh, representing client in a court, mediation, arbitration, what are the interpersonal skills that you need to have to effectively communicate some kind of uh, uh, lines that you need to take or perhaps understanding what the other side needs and how to fulfill that? Mm, that's, um, um, as politicians say, very good question, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think uh, um, you need to have fun with law and, and for me law is fun. Practicing law is fun, and, and doing what I'm doing is fun, and you, you need to like it, you need to love it, if you will, uh, the way, you, as in any profession, but you need to have fun. So I think that, um, had that we were, um, back in, in when, I, when I entered law school, um, there were certain requirements, there was an English test to be taken, I think, from, from the school I graduated, from the high school I graduated, we were like uh, the English specialized English language school. So the English test for the Latvian university was was not a problem. Everybody got 10 points out of 10 from that school. So we were like 60 graduates from that high school, and I think 45 entered the law school on that year. So um, eventually not, you know, very, just few are attorneys and, and um, practicing maybe law or not even practicing law anymore. But the, the idea, the concept, and I'm not saying that happened in that particular year, but what I heard and what I understood and, uh, is the, the, the idea was that, you know, you, you go to the law school, you'll finish the law school, and then uh, you will plant this tree in your backyard, and then you will just go there and, and shake it, and the money falls, and then you have a big room where you just stack that money up, and this is how it works. But eventually it doesn't work because you have to love what you're doing and you have to have fun with what you're doing. Of course, I mean, fun, people can argue, say, well, fun is, you are having fun, maybe it's not that much fun for me, but I still love it and I like it. So if you have the combination of love and fun, I think then you are on the right path and, and, and then you can uh, handle the cases. But it depends on, on what you want to exactly do. So if you're referring to what I'm doing, so I like negotiations, I like the, the as I said, closing of the deals. I like the business law, business approach, and, and, and hence I'm also a managing partner of the firm. So these, the, these items I like that very much. I like, for example, if I have to go to arbitration or court, I'll prefer arbitration. So the skills, if you ask the skills, mm -hmm. think aside from fun and love, which is also kind of a skill you need to have or pre-requirement yeah. you need to have, you, you need to have, what, what I'm telling the students at, at uh, RGSL and my fellow colleagues, you need to have the legal thinking. And if you don't have that legal thinking, if you cannot think those two, three, um, you know, curves forward, b before the curve, in the curve you are in, and two, three curves forward, so if you cannot think that way, and if you don't have that ability, it will be very difficult for you to be in, in law. So it's like in a racetrack, if you drive a race car, so if you make that first turn, you have to see how uh, you, you're going to do next two, three curves, because otherwise you are in that curve making a mistake, and you cannot get the car in the right, mm -hmm. you know, ideal traction, yeah. ideal tra trajectory, like we talk in the sports about it, you know, in this third curve because in the first curve you already messed up and you're just going to slide out of the, the track which has happened to me when I'm, I'm actually I'm doing the amateur race driving so cool. so it's, it's like you have to understand where yeah. it's in a, in a track analogy yeah. so with, with the law it is the same you need to have that legal thinking you need to look what what my parents have taught me you need to look these two three steps ahead you need to understand how it's going to play and, and not just write a contract and let's say, oh, it ended up in a court. Whoa, I didn't know how this is going to be decided. So when you write something, uh, you need to know how it's how it's going to play out. Like in a court, when, when people are saying, oh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to call these witnesses, you know, 
I'm going to call Marta, Christopher, and all these witnesses, and, and then my first question is, okay, we're going to call them, do you know what they're going to talk? And I'm not talking about, uh, you know, creating false testimonies yes. or anything, I'm just saying, what are they, well, no, no, we're going to ask them, you know, what did they do on this day, and, and but, uh, you know, you should ask yourself, do you know what they did on that day? Because they're going to answer it, so you need to, that question, you need to know what they will answer. So, um, uh, also it's important when you go in somewhere, you know how exactly it's going to play out. So, and then, you know, with developing your, 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 your skills, your professionality, then it's like, at the end of the day, you already know how it's going to play out. So, my, my wife uh, recently asked me, how, it's like, I had one, one closing and she was asking me, how did you know that it's going to close? How did you know that you're going to close the deal? I said, I, don't, I, I, just, I just knew it's going to happen because I walk in there and, and, and we're going to do this and nobody's going to leave until we do this. So, and, and before I walk in, I already knew this is going to happen, but you, you know, it just doesn't happen miraculously. Miracle doesn't happen, so you you know you you grow into this. But the legal thinking, the the way you think, is very important. And if you have that legal thinking, if you don't have it, then you have you will tremendously be tremendously difficult, and you will stumble from time to time. Or maybe you don't want that, then you just sit there and in maybe you are not at a law firm. You sit in, sit in a state institution. You just write some papers and really just you know, do some documents and you don't, you don't have an ambition that you want to develop further. Or so. so legal thinking, would you say it's risk management in, in, a, in essence? Well, risk, risk management is also something, you know, in everyday life, in professional life, but legal thinking is more that you, you, you understand when you see an article in the law, when you see an article uh, uh, in the law and, and you, you know how, what does it mean? You know how to apply it, and you know how it's going to be applied later, not just by one or another court, but how it's going to work in the contract, in a contractual relationship. Yes, in fact, how you manage that risk for the client when, when you have it or you don't have it in the agreement. So I was last week on Friday, I was asked by, by our um, other uh, partners that we work together with uh, from the finance world. They, they were asking me to step into one deal um uh, and 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 consult the client so i mean there's complex agreement and all these things and they they are financiers they don't know how it plays out legally so they asked me about w w from what you see how it's going to be what are the risks there as you say what are the risks so we had to explain it to the client what are the risks and how do we see them because as if you draw a comparison as with doctors you know it's like Yes, you might have, you know, your your leg might be hurting and you might be very, very worried about it. But when you come to the doctor, he will be very relaxed about it. It's like, okay, well, where is it hurting? Why is it hurting? Okay, you know what, what happened? Ha did you have a good night's sleep? And he's like, what is he talking about? Well, you should have slept, you know, already two years and you're not sleeping. This is my leg. Your leg is hurting because you, you, you had an injury because you didn't sleep. And you are thinking that you have a, you know, a, a very, tr very terrible disease. Mm -hmm. So it's something that you know you can help the client understand, and you know, they, and, and the regular people that have no experience in law, they they don't understand the things we do understand. Like doctors have different experience about COVID, if you will, or any diseases. They they, they look at it a completely other way, professionally, from their professional perspective. How did you uh, end up deciding to give lectures at RGSL? Did you get invited or it was your own willingness to give knowledge further to younger lawyers, the younger future lawyers? Yeah, you know, some, sometimes, Marta, I'm also thinking about this. Uh, then I was like, how did I, when I do lectures, how did I, why am, why, how did I end up here? So, uh, and, and um, actually when the revelation came, when, when I was talking to my dad, my dad was for 20, um, 20 years a lecturer at the University of Latvia. And actually now he started lecturing at RGSL, which, which I kindly asked him and, and the management of the school also asked him and he started to teach criminal law, criminal procedure a law um, after 20 years, um, uh, well, more the break was 20 years and he, for 20 years he had been teaching there. So when, when I was thinking, why am I here? It's like my father told me, he said, well, I think that you had that, that, that sort of a gene inside that you want to teach 
uh, and he had been teaching. And actually, my grandfather also was the teacher at the technical university. So it means that there is some kind of a gene that is just, just pushed in one way. But uh, actually, it happened because one of my classmates from school, she was working here. And I think, but I was, uh, you know, I was on a one or another conversation. I mentioned that I would be interested. So the initiative was for me because I thought that it would be interesting. And um, it, uh, there are two aspects. It, it keeps you in, in good shape as well. I mean, when you, when you are uh, lecturing, I think, and, and I think my fellow colleagues are also, I have suspicion doing that because it keeps you in a good shape with, with you know, being in an environment with students. And um, the other is uh, I like to, to share the knowledge. I think it's, it's important that I can, you know, ben, you know um, do something beneficial for RGS. And actually I'm doing it pro bono for RGSL, so it's, it's how my contribution, I feel very good about it, and uh, I like it that I can do contribution to a great school that, that I was part of, um, sort of comeback, if you will, uh, in, in this. So, um, yes, it, it just, I think these elements and, and, and you know, definitely the gene of teachers in our family is there so but now I'm a student myself so <laughs> again so but it's uh, it's uh, it's always good I think speaking of the environments academic environments it's always good to be also uh, there are people that would just prefer academic environments but if you have this combination that you are able to uh, do do some academic and, and, and be practicing it's a very good combination of both otherwise you're just practicing and not um, not having any academic uh, angle then, then maybe you're not uh, really using all your potential. Being probably in a school pushes you to also keep up with the doctrine, not only, you know, case law mm -hmm. or the law, but uh, also understanding some perhaps more broad principles that can be somehow applied to law and case law. Uh, being, I mean, perhaps making this kind of a practicing law more fun as you said before. Right, and, and of course, I, when, when you're absolutely right. When I talk with the students, I bring up cases that we have had and, and some new cases. And I, I, if I have, I think, like we did it this year or, or even in, in, in your class, I have a, like a current case and I just, you know, change the, a little bit the facts and maybe some, make something easier or more difficult and, and throw it in for the students to solve it. And it's very interesting also to see how, how the case is being solved. So, and giving a real life experience also to to students uh, is, is very important. So I think it's contribution. It just goes both ways. So if you take something, you need to give something. So you know, share the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so we were uh, t touching upon uh, TV series regarding mm -hmm. law, but uh, more generally, what TV series uh, sitcoms do you prefer? Uh, perhaps you have some favorites uh, that you that have inspired you or something that just uh, helps you relax in the end of the, at the end of the day well relaxing at the end of the day on a work day watching a, a sitcom is, is a bad idea first of all <laughs> because the, the new had, i think you can do it on the weekends yes. and if you want really or now it's not like you have to be in front of tv so you can just change it but i think you know uh Sometimes I mean, when you want to really switch the focus, it's very helpful because you just switch on something else and it gives you another world. And maybe it's necessary for people to do it every working uh, work business days at the end of each business day. So, but um, right now, if you speak of the, the sitcoms, I like the morning show. I'm watching the morning show, which is the second season already. Uh, I think it's uh, it's great. I mean, it's it's you know Apple is always good about its products and it's the best they can gather the actors and morning show is, is great. Um, it's, it's not about law, but it's it's a great uh, great setup and, and everything. So I think the great actors and a great place. So Americans know how to make sitcoms, that's for sure. And, and if it's Apple, then you have it like win-win. <laughs> so you cannot make it wrong. So it's it's a great. Uh, yes, of course, I have watched Suits, but I think I like the big, the series that were more in the beginning. And, and, yeah. and it's sort of, I think I have not followed everything through now, what has been happening. But I think, the, you know, from, yes, of course, it's interesting. And I, I have How to Get Away with Murder, you mentioned. Of course, you have, to, if, if a person has not watched it, they have to watch it even if they are not lawyers, because I think it's, it's just uh, gripping how you can, uh, from, from the 
producer's point of view to he to keep this going for like what it was five seasons yeah it just just it's amazing how you can keep this plot because usually it's first two seasons and then it, everything gets depleted and, and it doesn't work but now having five seasons and having that grip is like amazing so i think that uh yes the, the last one i'm sure i have watched i think i like very much billions and they are now airing the f fifth season as well it's it's about this uh, um, private investment firm maybe you have seen it uh, axel road and and all this is happening in america so it's it's also entertaining and great to to watch that and um yes i think the 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 sitcoms or any other activity that you have to, to shift the focus you know it's great like i went to the last james bond movie i mean mm -hmm. it's 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 actually well it's for boys i think uh, this one i last. was there i liked it yeah we liked <laughs> it, but it was a lot of shooting it was a lot of, I lot like of shooting sh yeah, okay but <laughs> it was uh, it was let's say if you compare it with other bond yeah. movies in the 15 year period when daniel craig from 2006 when he has been this was the most shooting ever in the movie because they are just like shooting shooting and shooting which is which is which is i also like it when there is action but uh, if you compare it with other, they, like Casino Royale, yeah. there was not so much shooting, so they, they introduced a lot of shooting here. But I guess they, since since the, the way the movie evolved, maybe they needed that shooting so much, I guess. So, so James Bond, Daniel Craig is like it's not a sitcom, but it's it's a 15 years of theatrical experience. I think also very good uh, movies that you have and. So yes, watching, but not overspending too much time. Uh, also, I mean, now their options are limitless. Of course, when you have yeah. different uh, subscription services, uh, uh, then you can just watch many, many movies or sitcoms. Uh, but there are a few classic movies you can always rewatch again, like a Good Year, you know, the movie, for example. So, yeah. Uh, as we're closing to the end, I wanted to ask you, maybe some of our students, uh, listeners are wondering, how do you decide what kind, which field of law I want to specialize in or what can I do to prepare myself for entering the market if previously I don't have gained that much of um, practical but only theoretical experience? And knowledge from the university. So, what 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 would you what would, what would be your advice? Which uh, area of law to practice? Uh, how to choose? How to choose? How to choose. Um, right now, I think uh, you have to differentiate whether you want to be in public. You do the public law, or private law. I think that that is something that you need to make up your mind where you want to be, and then starting from there that could be a good choice then you you narrow it down in that area but because if otherwise you're saying I'm, I'm doing constitutional law I'm doing business law these are like two different areas and then you need to understand and then also I think it's important to understand to vision we have a vision where you want to work you know it doesn't mean that you know you're gonna end up working but do you want to be in public sector or in private sector so if you see more yourself in the public sector then then eventually you are looking at more that it's a, it's a public law, so you have to choose that. So private, then you see private, then then you need to narrow it down, probably to what you are seeing whether you like really negotiations, you like the business angle, or or you like just maybe drafting contracts and not going out in the arena, mm -hmm. you know, to fight or stuff. Then of course it comes into the you can also narrow it down to litigation if you like if you just just do litigation but in latvia if you are thinking just about practicing in latvia you have to understand that the uh, market is is um, you know it's a small country it's a small market so you can just be a lawyer uh, saying i'm doing insurance law and i'm going to be a litigation insurance lawyer that is going to sue another uh, insurance companies and I'm just going to represent insurance companies. So you're just going to be waiting for that case to come because that case, you know, may come. Yeah. In Latvia, when when you're asked what, what do you practice or what do you do as a law firm or so, so <clears throat> I like to say it's a modern day general law. And then you can have some exceptions that you don't do. Then you refer clients to another firm or to another colleague. So uh, that means that you know when you are a student, you need to feel where this is actually going. So. If you're starting to, to get into criminal law and you like the, the writing uh, about the criminal law and exploring different issues, then you 
eventually you need to understand that you might end up in the prosecutor's office or you might end up as a defense attorney because you might be so you have to make that distinction also but there are certain areas also that are difficult like you said that you know everybody i think when uh, when professor likolaya she started teaching criminal law this year along with my with my dad criminal procedure then i think people expected that this is going to be csi miami immediately <laughs> and then it's like oh professor likola is teaching oh, where is csi miami oh no this criminal procedure that's for mr klotinj that's where you get the criminal procedure no it's criminal law you need to understand the concept oh i thought that we just going to go into csi stuff immediately <laughs> so there there you go and then you need to to have this focus and, and this is a study process this is what what's it for so you need to explore and you need to understand for example the criminal law is actually very difficult in the criminal procedure so uh, and it's a difficult discipline and 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 you need to really understand whether you like it because I, why am i saying this i know many people who don't like it and this is why they don't practice it and uh, so you can just need to make up your mind whether you what is the the, the way you want to specialize more i i want to ask you um as you've been and still are an arbitrator for quite a long time how do you deal with cases when you see that those parties are in, on such broad terms and they can't reach an agreement they are constantly there's tension in the room how do you deal with it how how, how these situations are approached well you know speaking of the anyways of the outcome of any litigation or arbitration the best judgment or arbitral award is when both parties are not satisfied So when you are asking me about this tension in the room so the best thing is that they both are not satisfied with the outcome then this is the best judgment because the best award is when both parties have not been satisfied with it so it's like I'm, I'm telling it to the clients and they're saying I don't understand what you're talking about we want to win but you know actually the win is when you're both not satisfied because going to arbitration or litigation is the last course actually if you have not been able to, to settle your dispute so you are entrusting somebody else because you already have huge differences but uh with with uh, this is more a task of course in mediation when you have to bring the parties together and this is a very let's say the technique you need to employ you need to hear out each party and to direct them into the right decision so this is where you bring down the tension and you 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 mediate the dispute in arbitration there is of course it's easy easier for arbitrators or for judges at the court then you have a certain procedure so one person is going to speak then the next one is going to speak and and actually with with this online online forums it's become even easier because you know you give a word and nobody interrupts the person because until they are finished like in a in a podcast sort of, <laughs> type of thing. Yeah. so but uh, you know you need to hear out the parties you need to uh, you need to let them speak you need to let them express their opinions when they get this heat off then i think then you can move on but uh, you can also you have a framework you have a procedure so you set them in a certain procedure and uh, you know maybe your question is also when it is difficult uh to to make an award to make a decision if you have let's say concurring opinions and and how do you do this but then again this is not a beauty contest so you put aside the emotions and and uh, and you you know you just look what you think is the correct and, and just uh solution so on um you know if you have enough experience then you see see where the, the, the solution should be so but the best thing is for parties to get settled so the, to push them for settle so they settled then you they, they end the dispute so it's not like we need we have as arbitrators ambition that we want to rule on everything so settling is always and don't go to court or arbitration because that's the worst place where you can solve disputes <laughs> i mean if the parties are not satisfied I, i believe they have a question because arbitration is pretty expensive and then that's why It, they are shocked oh, i'm like, oh my god but we we didn't win we didn't get what we wanted but we paid a lot of money for that and i see that you know shock in their eyes and oh, i don't like this perhaps the last question is there some kind of a book that you would recommend uh, students read to read perhaps something that you like to read uh, yourself in the past or now well I'm, right now i'm reading the the promised land of barack obama you have to like america and, and and the concept and i like let's say the former president barack obama and um it's a great book he has written himself 
And actually, if you even want it, there is an audio book that he himself speaks that right. book out. So it's a great, yeah. great way. I think it's a great book, but then you have to like a little bit of politics, I think, and it's a, it's a great reading. Um, uh, there are some, let's say, I, I'm looking forward to Robin Sharma's new book. I have ordered it, uh, The Everyday Hero. So I think it's it's uh, also something that, you know, inspirational you can read. Uh, actually, with Robin Sharma, I would recommend that you would, you know, sometimes his books are, let's say, uh, too intense. What I've personally experienced that they're just giving you so much information and pushing you a lot of information into you. So if you do a course with Robin Sharma and then read his books, that, then it's even better. This mm -hmm. is what I have experienced, um, that it's it's a more interesting way to, to have him as a, as, a, as in a course, and then you can have his book. So uh, I'm looking forward to that book. The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari or 5 a.m. Club? The, the, I have not read the 5 a.m. Club, I have read The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, but the, the new book that is he has just completed this year, The Everyday Hero Manifesto. It's like a combination of all his books together. He has done it, he's been writing it during the pandemic, and now he has published it, and it just did not reach it yet. But he has had some bits and pieces out of that book, and it's, it's, a, it's a great book. Uh, so I think uh, it will be a great book, so I'm looking forward to reading it. And yes, uh, I actually, lately I've been, you know, j fiction, and of course John Grisham, you can read John Grisham, it's easy reading and, and it's um, you can choose the book even the f old ones the firm or, or I think the the movie with the Tom Cruise the firm is, is great you can always watch it and John Grisham is about it's a easy reading law but John Le Carre the late author that is a spy novelist I like spy novels so John Me Le Carre too. John Le Carre is a different English it's it's English English it's not John Grisham but then again they know they're what they are writing for, and uh, then it's it's um, great books. Yes, so um, from from the lead, I think if you are a law student, you have to, you have to read John Grisham. It's just <laughs> it's just the way it works. So um, it's great books, but uh, and the arbitration book, I think it's a bit, but maybe because I like arbitration, is Redfern and Hunter's book that is also available in this library about international commercial arbitration. It's a, it's a fantastic book. It's like a novel, I think. I can read it and, and uh, reread it. So it's a, it's a great reading material. Ivo, thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank it was a pleasure. Yeah. I think, uh, I hope this episode is very insightful for our listeners. Many media references that uh, now we have a list of, of things to watch and things to read. Thank you really for that. And thank you for, for covering uh, many perspectives on law as an arbitrator, as a mediator. Uh, in litigation, uh, uh, etc. Yeah, nice start of a Monday morning. Yes, thank you. Really. Perfect, thank you.